Welcome back. This lecture provides an overview of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA. I'd like to start with a little history and an overview of FISA. Then I'll sketch the modern structure of the statutory scheme. So first up, some history. For about two centuries, Congress left foreign intelligence almost exclusively to the executive branch. Early spying was fairly ad hoc and related primarily to foreign affairs and military concerns. In the 20th century, the United States professionalized spying. Efforts were initially concentrated in the uniformed services, but by mid-century, an entire intelligence field was taking form. In 1952, President Truman established the National Security Agency within the Department of Defense. To this day, the NSA is the premier United States Signals Intelligence Agency. In the intelligence community's modern structure, agency efforts are channeled through a director of national intelligence. The American intelligence community works closely with its counterparts abroad, especially on signals intelligence matters. The members of the Cold War era UK-USA agreement, usually called the Five Eyes, are particularly close collaborators. All right, back to the history. In the mid 20th century, the executive branch was largely unchecked by the other branches on foreign intelligence matters. That isn't to say the executive branch thought it had unlimited authority. Historical records reflect that some surveillance policies were narrowed out of constitutional concerns. Let me put that differently. Historically, the authority for foreign intelligence was rooted in the president's inherent Article II powers. And the key legal check on that authority was the Fourth Amendment. But the Fourth Amendment, as interpreted by the executive branch, in secret. That paradigm for the most part, has actually not changed. Executive Order 12333, which is the leading basis for American signals intelligence, reflects this very same view of the law. We'll look at 12333 soon. I should note that courts did start to articulate how the Fourth Amendment applies to national security in the early 1970s. That doctrinal development mostly came to an end with FISA, though. So, the 1970s were a rough time for intelligence agencies. Let me give a few examples. A number of intelligence failures and misstatements came to light in the course of the Vietnam War. The Watergate scandal cratered trust in the executive branch. And the CIA compiled a report dubbed the Family Jewels, recounting illegal agency activities. A journalist at the New York Times, Seymour Hersh, began receiving and printing leaks from that report. The White House responded by launching a review of the CIA, and the Church Committee in the Senate and the Pike Committee in the House both delved into what the intelligence community had been up to. A number of deeply concerning and flagrantly illegal programs came to light. Let me emphasize a few. COINTELPRO was an FBI program to covertly infiltrate domestic political groups. The NSA's Minaret program involved warrantless interception of domestic electronic communications. Shamrock was bulk collection of one-end foreign telegrams. That is, telegrams where one end is outside the United States. In the HT Lingual program, CIA officers opened and photographed mail to and from Russia and China. And in one of the weirdest programs, MKUltra, the CIA engaged in human behavioral experimentation. I wish I were making this stuff up. So, because of these programs and others, there was unprecedented outrage directed at the intelligence community. Congress responded by establishing intelligence oversight committees. In the Senate, the Select Committee on Intelligence. And in the House, the
the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Those congressional committees exist to this day. The original idea was that legislators would have the time and the resources to deeply understand intelligence activities. These days, there is widespread criticism that the committees have just been captured by the intelligence community. They're uncritically supportive and, in fact, insulate the intelligence community from transparency and from reform. Congress's legislative response was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. It's just called FISA for short. And the basic idea was to strike a compromise, balancing national security and civil liberties. The executive branch would be allowed to continue intelligence operations within the United States, but under court supervision. Put differently, the government was going to need to get foreign intelligence wiretap orders from a court. The orders would look a lot like ordinary Title III wiretap orders. There were some differences in the specifics, though, such as notice of a wiretap. Under the Wiretap Act, a target must always receive notice. Under FISA, notice only has to be provided if criminal charges are filed. Now, recall that to get a wiretap order, law enforcement agencies had to demonstrate probable cause that there would be evidence of a crime. Foreign intelligence investigations, of course, often don't involve criminal activity. So, FISA switched what probable cause applies to. The government needs to show probable cause that the target is a foreign power or an agent of a foreign power. That includes other nations' governments, as well as terrorist groups. Now, since this is a unique and highly sensitive role for judges, FISA established two new courts. The first is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, or the FISA Court, or the FISC. It's comprised of district court judges. Appeals from there go to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of Review, or FISA Court of Review, or FISCR. The judges on that court are drawn from the federal appellate courts. Finally, appeals from the FISCR go to the Supreme Court of the United States. It's important to note that, originally, the FISA court system was magistrate-like. By that I mean, FISC judges just reviewed the facts for individual surveillance orders. Originally, those were just wiretap orders, and later they included physical search warrants and pen trap orders. The FISC judges generally did not interpret the law, and specifically, they did not much consider the scope of authority under FISA. That changed. Following the USA Patriot Act in 2001, FISA judges increasingly considered legal arguments. That's a huge change. These judges had to make really difficult legal decisions, and they generally heard only from the government. What's more, they generally didn't publicly publish opinions, so there wasn't any opportunity for outside feedback. We're going to see some extraordinarily questionable statutory interpretation that resulted from this change, and the associated lack of adversarial argument and absence of transparency. Let me make a couple other observations about the FISA court system. Sometimes the FISC and FISCR are referred to as secret courts. That's somewhat true in the sense that they review classified material, they don't hold public hearings, and they used to not make their opinions public. On the other hand, ordinary magistrate judges review surveillance orders all the time under seal, often without holding any hearing or writing any opinion. So there's a fairly strong parallel between how courts engage with law enforcement and how they engage with intelligence authorities. The judges of the FISC and the FISCR are appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That position has been held by a conservative since FISA was enacted. Many observers have criticized the composition of the FISA courts as also being conservative, and therefore being sympathetic to the intelligence community's views. 
FISA has certainly evolved since it was first enacted, and I want to note three major revisions to the scheme. These certainly aren't the only updates, but they're some of the most important for the upcoming material. They are the USA Patriot Act, enacted after the September 11th attacks, the Protect America Act of 2007, and the FISA Amendments Act of 2008. Yes, that last one is technically the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Amendments Act. Go figure. The very final note I'd like to make about FISA's history is the so-called FISA wall. As a matter of executive branch policy, and less a matter of statutory law, there was a sharp division between intelligence and law enforcement. The relevant agencies had limited collaboration and information sharing. In the 2000s, the FISA wall came down. Federal intelligence and law enforcement agencies developed lasting relationships, and to this day work together quite closely. There has been a tremendous amount of policy debate about whether the FISA wall should have come down, and there continues to be debate about whether it should be rebuilt. All right, so there's some background on where FISA came from and an overview of its general approach. Now let me sketch the modern structure of the statutory scheme. So, here's a roadmap through the FISA surveillance authorities. They almost exclusively relate to surveillance within the United States, save one exception that I'll get to. The first part of FISA deals with wiretaps. It sets out FISA wiretap orders, which are a lot like the Title III wiretap orders that we've already seen. It also allows for many forms of wiretapping, without a warrant, if no U.S. persons are involved. The next part of FISA covers physical searches. In intelligence lingo, these are called black bag jobs. In order to conduct these physical searches, federal agents apply for FISA search warrants, much like the Rule 41 search warrants that we've already seen. Again, there's allowance for warrantless searches where no U.S. persons are involved. The third part of FISA addresses pen registers and trap and trace devices. The text sets out FISA pen trap orders, borrowing substantially from ECPA's pen trap provisions. I'm going to put a little star next to this one to highlight that it was the basis for a bulk surveillance program. Next up is the part of FISA that covers business records. It introduces a new type of court order, the FISA business records order. That gets a bulk surveillance star, too. The last part of FISA that I'd like to emphasize deals with combined electronic surveillance. By combined, what I mean is that these provisions can be used for either prospective or retrospective electronic surveillance. These provisions are especially complicated, so feel free to rewind as necessary. One section in this part of FISA is the notorious Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act. It provides for combined warrantless surveillance inside the United States when targeting non-U.S. persons outside the United States. That's a mouthful, so let me say it differently. If a foreigner is outside the country and sends some data into the country, then this warrantless provision applies. It's the basis of a bulk program, so it gets a star. Another section in this part of FISA sets out a combined court order for targeting a U.S. person who's overseas but still has some data in the country. The last section is similar, except it applies to surveillance outside the country. That provision of FISA is very unique. It's the only part of the statutory scheme that regulates government conduct outside the United States. All right, so that was just a lot of law. To recap, let me present it a little differently. We've spent a lot of time on the procedures for law enforcement under the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure and the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Let's compare those to the national security procedures 
under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and related statutes. First up are provider subpoenas. As I hope you recall, those allow access to a limited subset of stored communications metadata. The closest national security analog is the National Security Letter, which isn't actually part of FISA, but is closely related. It's a type of administrative subpoena. Next up are deorders. I hope you remember that those allow access to all stored communications metadata. There, the closest national security analog is the FISA business record order. More on those soon. The next law enforcement procedure I'd like to analogize is the pen trap order. That one's really easy. FISA just has its own pen trap provisions. Next up are provider warrants, which I hope you recall from the Stored Communications Act. Oddly enough, FISA does not really have a parallel to the provider warrant. For a U.S. person inside the United States, either a physical search warrant or a wiretap order would very likely function as a provider warrant. For a U.S. person outside the United States, a combined warrant and wiretap order is available. For non-U.S. persons inside the United States, a warrantless physical search or wiretap is sometimes available, but sometimes a warrant or wiretap order would be required. Finally, for non-U.S. persons outside the United States, there's a warrantless program. Again, that's the notorious Section 702. The last law enforcement procedure I'd like to analogize is the familiar Title III wiretap order. Over on the national security side, the procedures are very similar to what I just covered for provider warrants. The only difference is that the physical search warrant provisions are, of course, not applicable. Let me make a couple observations about FISA's modern structure. First, you might be wondering what isn't covered by FISA. The answer is most foreign intelligence operations. The overwhelming majority of American intelligence is conducted under Executive Order 12333. FISA only covers operations within the United States. There is, again, that one exception for electronic surveillance targeting U.S. persons outside the U.S. The other observation I would make is that it's absolutely critical to check statutory definitions when thinking through a FISA matter. Just like we saw with ECPA, the definition of a term can totally flip the outcome of an issue. For instance, the term physical search is defined to only cover searches inside the United States. If you weren't reading closely, you might think FISA covers physical searches outside the United States. All right, so there's a big picture sketch of FISA's modern structure. Before closing, let me share a little data on how the federal government has used the FISA wiretap and physical search provisions. For these two authorities, the data reported by the government is pretty good. I'd like to emphasize three features of the graph. First, the FISA physical search provisions were enacted in 1995, so that's why physical searches don't initially appear. While the government's top-line figures combine wiretap orders and physical searches, more recent reports have somewhat teased them apart. So this much is clear. The overwhelming majority of applications are for a wiretap order, or for a wiretap order in conjunction with a physical search warrant. Very few FISA applications are solely for a physical search warrant. The second feature I'd like to note is that in the years following the September 11th attacks, the executive branch increasingly turned to FISA authority. Applications over doubled. The final point I'd like to make is that after 2006, FISA applications dropped off sharply. The likely explanation for this is that the executive branch gained new surveillance authority under the Protect America Act and the FISA Amendments Act. Where the FBI and NSA would have previously used a FISA wiretap order, they instead used their new authority, which didn't require individualized court approval. All right, so there's a little data on the FISA wiretap and physical search provisions. 
In the upcoming lectures, we're going to work through the details of a few specific national security procedures.